Hello, welcome to educator.com. This is the first lecture of the microbiology course, and in this lecture, we're going to discuss present day microbiology, and then we're going to go back in time and look at these very critical and important discoveries. And along the way, we're going to discuss the relevance of them and really introduce you to the full breadth and depth of all of these lectures that will constitute microbiology. So just to start off, what will this lecture entail? We're going to define microbiology. We're going to, you know, set it up in terms of the things that we're going to emphasize and discuss. Then we're going to go back and talk about the history and go back in time, as I said. And we're going to review some of the pioneers in the field in relationship to what it was that they brought to the field. And these these discoveries that they made are critical in relationship to really developing and distinguishing these parameters in relationship to the field in general and the field in specifically. And they also indicate places in which we are still conducting research and moving things yet further into this frontier of the unknown. And, you know, microbiology as a field is just exploding as far as the relevance to human health. It's, you know, as, as, uh, you know, living in a Western country, for instance, you know, we, we figured that, uh, we, we had basically cured, uh, the population of these human pathogens. And what's happening is they are coming back. And not only that, they are coming back in a major way. And it's causing the whole field of medicine and uh, biology to expand even further beyond our wildest dreams, really. And so it, it, it it's really, this course is really about thinking how we're going to solve these major problems that are certainly in front of us as human beings and, and what we can do on a worldwide level in terms of creating ways in which we can prevent the onset of disease. We can develop ways to potentially live with microbes instead of eradicating them, for instance, and, you know, figuring out new and different ways of in the cases of where these infections are potentially drastically devastating to think of new ways of eradicating these pathogens without harming human health. And, and that part of the equation is very challenging and we will certainly review that all throughout the course. So in terms of microbiology, it's important to really get a sense of where things are today. So in this particular picture, this is a cover of Science Magazine, and you can see this is a, 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 a microbe, a, a parasite, so to speak, and it's carried by the tsetse fly. This is the disease that causes, uh, you know, the sleeping sickness that is predominant in Africa, this trypanosoma. It's a, it's a parasitic, uh, a protozoa and it's carried by an insect and the insect infects the human host. This is a lethal disease. It's a very serious problem in Africa and it's representative of what the field of microbiology entails, which is it's a study of the biology of the pathogen it's a study of the biology of the vector and in this case it is a study of the biology of the insect the tsetse fly and it's also a study of the biology of the human host and so in the course we're really going to cover these three areas in depth. And we're going to describe, for instance, the different adaptations that pathogens have made in relationship to infecting the human host and surviving in the human host. And then we're going to talk about adaptations that the humans have developed in relationship to managing uh, 
infections by these pathogens, eradicating these pathog pathogens through immune mechanisms, and, uh, and then also the environment in which both the pathogen and the human host live in, and in this case, the third organism, which is the insect that carries the disease. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to think about the common threads between the different organisms in relationship to the patterns of infection, for instance. So there are commonalities between the bacteria, between the protozoa, between the fungi, and between and the helminths or the worms and all of these groups these four uh, groups of organisms in some cases share the very same adaptation it's not the same morphologically but mechanistically it's very much the same so we're going to be covering those concepts as well and because in terms of approaching this field of microbiology it's often easier to learn about the details if you can get an understanding about how they all fit together because then for instance you need then you can learn the concepts very well and then you can see how the different classes of organisms fulfill these concepts. So, so that's the other approach that we're going to take in relationship to our lectures in microbiology. So as far as a definition, now most folks who don't know much about microbiology see the word microbiology and automatically they think microbiology is the study of small organisms. And these are generally uh, organisms that one cannot see with the naked eye. And these are organisms that have very complicated molecular mechanisms. But in reality, microbiology also includes studies of very large organisms, like for instance, the tapeworms. Some of these tapeworms can grow as long as 30 feet. And, and on the other end of the scale, we can, we go all the way down to these viral particles, even prions. And these are non-living things that they are basically DNA, uh, at least in the case of viruses, what it's, a, it's DNA or RNA encased in a protein capsule. So we go all the way from that very small, small, minute atomic level all the way up to worms that can get as long as 30 or more feet. So in in terms of the scale here, you can see here we've got DNA and you know the atomic level down here, and then we've got viruses, bacteria, we've got um, protozoa that live, for instance, among uh, red blood cells, and and then we have insects, and then of course we have tapeworms, which of course are even bigger than a meter. So, so anyway, it's a, it's a very broad range of organisms. Another central principle that is shared by many of these organisms is how these organisms live together. Are they commensal? Do they share a mutually beneficial relationship? Is the relationship benefiting one and not harming the other? Or is the relationship parasitic? Is one benefiting at the expense of the other? So that's another important concept that links many of these microorganisms together. But the other important point is the focus of this course is really medical microbiology, that we're really going to look at the pathogens that cause human disease. Because many of you, I'm, I'm assuming, are either wanting to go to medical school, wanting to go into some kind of health profession, uh, wanting, wanting to gain a better understanding about the biology of these diseases, in which case then you, we really want you to come away with a very good knowledge and a deep understanding of these pathogens that infect the human host. So microbiology, my God, um, you know, one of the places that we're going to start with, or at least cover uh, often throughout the whole class, is the fact that not all microorganisms are harmful, right? Um, some of them, like for instance, the ones who engage in photosynthesis, 
are essential to life on Earth. And in fact, there are more microorganisms or that microorganisms produce more energy and more oxygen in the environment through photosynthesis than do green plants. So, you know, we need to worry, of course, about deforestation, but we also need to worry about desertification in the oceans, that we need to make sure that our plankton stores do not get depleted as well. We need to make sure that the algae living in fresh water don't get eradicated or, or contaminated or, or poisoned um, as well, that all of these organisms are really critical to maintaining life. So in relationship to photosynthesis, we have this uh, all human, uh, well not human, all organisms, right? Plants and animals are dependent on one another in relationship to plants producing oxygen and animals consuming uh, oxygen, of course, and producing carbon dioxide. So this codependence between plants and animals are essential and nowhere more essential is that in relationship to the microorganisms. So, you know, most organisms on the planet are microorganisms and also 90% of the cells in our bodies are microbes. Just what you wanted to hear. Okay, so let's go back in time and let's think about these critical discoveries that really pushed forth, that brought forth microbiology as a discipline. And these discoveries in these various key areas are continuing to be made. So the first discovery was Loanoak, who was a Dutchman who lived in the 1700s. He was a glassmaker and he invented the microscope, uh, so to speak, or, or an apparatus that enabled him to see very, very tiny organisms. And what he ended up doing was he found ways to combine different lenses, different uh, magnitudes, uh, different degrees of resolution with these lenses. And he was able to combine them in a way so that he could see very, very small organisms. And his real commitment was discovery and you know, he, he didn't really know what he was seeing. He was just realizing that he had created a very important piece of equipment that certainly furthered the study of biology and human health. So his world basically were these very precise types of instruments that he created where he put together these different glass lenses in a way, as I described, that he was able to see very, very tiny things to the point that he could actually draw yeast that were visualized with his microscope. And, and yeast are very, very tiny fungi, and uh, his drawings are certainly reflective of the yeast that we can see which with much better equipment. So the next very important discovery was also made in the 1700s by uh, Jenner, and he invented the first vaccine. He couldn't see, for instance, smallpox. He couldn't see the, the virus responsible for cowpox, but what he observed was that uh, women who milked cows got these uh, characteristic lesions. They were cowpox lesions. And these women were also protected from smallpox. None, you know, they, everyone else, you know, smallpox is a very contagious disease. And everywhere else, people would get smallpox in a village, for instance, but the the folks who were continually spared were these women who milked cows. And what ended up happening was he concluded that possibly getting this cowpox actually protected these women, these women from developing smallpox. So what, so this is a picture actually, it's online uh, at the CDC. And you can see here is the uh, lesions that characterize smallpox. And so what Jenner ended up doing was he actually so-called inoculated 
uh, a young boy by the pus, right, from the um, women who had a cowpox lesion. And, and he then also um, used lesions that were actually on the cows as well. And so what he would do, he, was, he would take the pus from the cows and he would actually inject the pus into other individuals. And because the pus, of course, carried this virus, the cowpox virus, the immune systems of the people that he inoculated develop an developed antibodies against the cowpox. And these antibodies were cross-reactive and they also protected them from development of smallpox. So, so probably the pus, right, contained the cowpox virus, but of course, he didn't know that. He couldn't see the virus. He, he didn't know what antibodies were. He just very carefully, uh, reasoned and deduced this whole, uh, sequence, this whole experimental process. Maybe we can even, you know, uh, give him credit for the invention of the first clinical trial. I mean, who knows? But anyway, very, very important discovery. So, um, so, and, and we are continuing to develop research in this area. The vaccinology field is very, very important because, for instance, right now, we're doing quite a lot of work to develop vaccines against uh, very, very important diseases like malaria, for instance, and HIV, for instance. And these two diseases in particular, we are going to discuss as completely separate lectures. Also tuberculosis. We don't, we have BCG vaccine for tuberculosis uh, among individuals who live in Africa and Asia. But that's not a very effective vaccine at all. So there's a lot of research also going on in developing a much more effective vaccine for tuberculosis. So we will have separate lectures for malaria. We're going to have one devoted lecture to malaria, completely devoted lecture to HIV, and a completely devoted lecture to tuberculosis. Now, my own research, I'm currently conducting, uh, working with a research team in India on uh, HIV in rural Indian women, and we're implementing a nutritional intervention. So when we get to the uh, AIDS uh, or HIV AIDS uh, lecture, I will present some of what I'm doing uh, in that lecture and some of the thinking that we're coming up with in relationship to our research. So the next invention or the next inventor that we're going to discuss certainly is Louis Pasteur, who was a Renaissance man of his time. And he came up with quite a few theories that were essential to the study of medicine and human health, as well as the study of microbiology. So one of the, one of the theories he actually disproved was the theory of spontaneous generation. And, uh, during the time, during that time, other fellow scientists, uh, individuals believed that life arose spontaneously, that nothing was needed, that these organisms would just arise with out of the blue sky, so to speak. And so what he did was he created this apparatus that uh, enabled, well, you know, it, 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 it prevented, let's put it that way, it prevented um, microbes from being able to enter the flask, right, from the air. So if, for instance, he could prevent the air from entering the flask and no life arose, then perhaps it wasn't spontaneous. And that if, for instance, he could introduce air into the flask, and then after introducing air, he would find that life arose, he could then conclude that these microbes lived in the air and that they would only arise if the this particular flask was expo exposed to the ambient air. 
So he also came up, he also furthered the field of vaccination. He, he uh, was able to develop a vaccine for rabies, and rabies is a virus. So he, you know, we had vaccine number two for rabies very early time. And, um, and he also came up with pasteurization, which is uh, available to this day. And that's where you heat fluids that uh, potentially may, may harbor microorganisms. And by doing that, you're able to sterilize them. So he found that by heating wine, beer, milk, or vinegar, not, not a long time, not enough to curdle or change the composition of the, of the, the liquid, but enough to kill the microorganisms and thereby, excuse me, and thereby pasteurizing and sterilizing these substances. So, uh, and, and he furthered the development of our understanding about anthrax as well. Now, we're also, as, as you can imagine, we're going to speak in depth about many of these organisms, and then you'll be able to see, indeed, how these mechanisms work. So the next pioneer on the scene was Robert Koch. And Robert Koch was a very uh, dedicated scientist. You can see him here at his desk with thousands, you know, a lot of uh, uh, petri dishes. And uh, of course, they had microscopes at the time and all these different chemicals. He was a typical scientist that, uh, you know, some of us are that way. We have very, um, complicated working spaces, let's put it that way. And by through his work, he was able to come up with these postulates or these laws about disease causation that to this day are still important, uh, integral to the study of medicine, for instance, integral to disease causation, integral to developing rationale and algorithms for diagnoses and integral to the study of epidemiology as well that these postulates are are just like uh, laws in epidemiology basically and and of course my doctorate is in epidemiology and you know we we all in the in the field that I'm in in the discipline that I'm in it's it's really about being very rigorous methodical and and minimizing extraneous influences, for instance, in terms of coming up with risk factors for diseases, causation of disease, and in some cases, if there are chances that diseases can arise from other, in other ways, then you really can't have a pure cause of disease. And so, in any event, his postulates are critical and essential to the study of medicine and human health. So what are his postulates? Well, what he determined, he, he, <clears throat> he set up these very rigorous uh, laws to be able to determine, for instance, whether or not a particular microbe caused a particular disease. So the way in which he set that up is he took to, he took a diseased animal, he isolated the suspected pathogen from that animal, he cultured the pathogen, then he uh, took what was thought to be the pathogen after culturing, after growing it, after multiplying it, making sure that it wasn't contaminated with other things, purifying it, and then injecting that pathogen into a healthy animal. And then if the healthy animal developed the disease, then he did one further step, which was he took the pathogen from that diseased animal, he cultured that pathogen, and if the culture from the, the diseased animal who received the pathogen from the original animal after culturing, getting the disease, culturing again, if that culture 
was the same as the original culture, then he could conclude, indeed, it was that pathogen and not another one that caused the disease in this animal. This is a critical concept because, as we know, uh, in modern day, we have these very complex diseases that arise from many different causes, and it a lot of diseases aren't necessarily one cause, one disease. But in the purified infectious disease environment, we're, we're close. I mean, we certainly have in other covariates. And all along the course, we will talk about the influence of these other factors because they can't, these other factors can certainly determine who gets the disease as compared to who doesn't, even if, for instance, both individuals are infected with the pathogen. So another important and critical pioneer was Alexander Fleming, who discovered the first antibiotic, which was penicillin. And he was culturing Staph aureus, a gram-positive bacteria, on these agar plates. And uh, accidentally, some fungi landed on these agar plates that were growing Staph aureus. And he noticed that around the area where these fungi were, there were no Staph aureus, that the Staph aureus had actually been eradicated. So he thought, my God, what is what what happened to my culture? At first he thought, you know, it was ruined. And then he 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 tried to see, well my God, what happened here? Why did these bacteria die? And so he was able to isolate uh, these fungi and he observed that penicillin was a fungus that had produced this, you know, constituent, so to speak, that was actually able to eradicate this gram-positive bacteria, Staph aureus, which we will learn about in great detail when we discuss the gram-positive bacteria. So let's summarize what we did discussed today. And you'll see that some of the lectures that are, are in microbiology are short, like this one. Some of them are longer, but for the most part, they're pretty brief, uh, very uh, contained and very focused discussions on these critical concepts that are important to microbiology. But we also have, you know, some hour long or so lectures on concepts that really require that degree of discussion. So as we as we described, we talked about the history of microbiology in relationship to these very important discoveries. The ability to visualize microorganisms to this day, we're continually developing new techniques to see smaller and smaller and smaller things. And uh, we now have an atomic force microscope. We used to think, well, gosh, you know, the electron microscope was about as small as we can get. Well, we're actually going to the atomic level now. And, uh, you know, maybe we've stopped there or we may continue. But the 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 point here is that the better able you are to visualize these disease-causing pathogens, the better able you are to understand them, and the better off you are in relationship to treating them, and the better off you are in relationship to preventing them. So, it, so one of the critical components of microbiology is developing these techniques to be able to identify the pathogen. So the, the next very critical discovery was the discovery of vaccination by Edward Jenner. I mean, in the 1700s, no doubt. He didn't know what antibodies were. He had never seen a virus, but he was able to come up with a pretty effective vaccine of his day. It was incredible. Louis Pasteur in the 1800s dismissed the theory of spontaneous generation, came up with this pasteurization technique that we are still using today, uncovered a lot more about fermentation, and was able to develop a vaccine against rabies.
germ theory of disease, Robert Koch. To this day, we are still using his Koch's postulates with the understanding, however, that diseases are a little more complicated, but we can see, for instance, how we can use his, his postulates to enable us to you know, determine the etiology of, of very complex diseases. And then finally, the invention of the antibiotic. Now, certainly we're, we're realizing that we may be running out of possibilities in relationship to developing antibiotics, but maybe we need to rethink the whole field. Maybe we need to learn how to, for instance, create situations where we introduce one uh, species of commensal bacteria, for instance, or several species of commensal bacteria to crowd out uh, maybe a cholera bacteria, for instance, or figure out, you know, how can we maintain a healthy community of bacteria without using antibiotics? Maybe we need to introduce other kinds of bacteria. I mean, it, it, the world and the field is is open to so many new things. Uh, so anyway, that that concludes our discussion of the lecture. Now, at the end of the lecture, we, ha we always will have uh, several thought-provoking questions. These are not multiple choice questions. These are really thinking kind of questions. And these may re reflect questions or represent questions that you might get on your own exams. But it, I, I can guarantee you these questions, a lot of them don't even have a right answer. They just will provoke a lot of thinking, uh, no doubt. So the first question, that's not too difficult, is, is it? Who formulated the germ theory of disease? Robert Koch. And these, uh, are, oh, excuse me, the germ theory of disease. Yes, it is. Robert Koch uh, coined and created these disease postulates that were based on the germ theory of disease. During which century was vaccination first discovered? It was, believe it or not, discovered in the 1700s. So what other discovery occurred at that time? The discovery of the microscope, Loanoke. Now, you know, Jenner did, it, it's my understanding, I, I don't even think he had a microscope, but you know, he really didn't need a microscope in terms of what it was that he did. I mean, it was pretty amazing. It took a lot of real scientific reasoning in relationship to uncovering uh, this idea that vaccination could be done in terms of preventing disease. Now, I must qualify the the previous uh, question. I, I as I'm going through, I'm I'm thinking about it a little more. Actually, the initial the initiator of the germ theory, essentially, we could say, was Pasteur. And then, of course, Koch. So both really are responsible for the germ theory. Pasteur, first of all, and then Koch. And, and we can certainly give them both credit for that one. But anyway, and that's how science is, really. It, it often isn't just one individual who comes up with the discovery, but that individual is certainly beholding to everybody else who, you know, supported them and, you know, was a team. And, and certainly uh, that happens quite often in science today, who really is responsible for something. It generally is a group of people. So do cautious postulates of disease causation hold for all diseases? The answer is no, not all diseases. Why is that? Well, you know, we have very complicated diseases. Some of the cancers, for instance, heart disease, these diseases arise from multiple causes. But we can even take as an example some of the cancers that arise from infectious disease. So, for instance, HPV and cervical cancer and also the Helicobacter pylori, 
and uh, gastric cancer. Now, what do we know about these organisms? So HPV, human papillomavirus, is a virus that uh, is a sexually transmitted disease. And many, many individuals get become infected by HPV, uh, you know, while they're young adults. And uh, not, fortunately, not everybody who gets infected by HPV goes on to develop cervical cancer. There is only a very small percentage of individuals who develop cervical cancer or a small percentage of individuals who originally became infected with HPV and then got cervical cancer. But if we look at all the individuals who have cervical cancer, all the women, of course, uh, there are some men who have a, a form of it, an anal type cancer that is caused by HPV. If we look at those individuals, we will see that they were all infected but certainly it took more, <clears throat> excuse me, it took more than just the HPV virus to get cervical cancer. It took other risk factors, smoking, genetic susceptibility, and other factors that also along with HPV then cause cervical cancer. H. pylori is a bacteria, gram-negative, <coughs> excuse me, and it's a gram-negative bacteria that lives in the digestive tract. After many, many, many years, a very small percentage of individuals who were infected with H. pylori go on to develop gastric cancer. It's a very similar story. What are the other cofactors, diet, uh, some problem with immunity, and other factors, you know, salt, that, that countries that uh, have high salt content in their diet uh, that preserve foods, they have very high rates of gastric cancer. So it may be that these cofactors and the original infectious agent cause the disease. So identifying which cofactor is still very complicated and very challenging, but the original presence of that infectious agent is certainly critical, but not everybody, in fact, a very small percentage of those individuals who were infected actually go on to develop these cancers. So what is the theory of spontaneous generation? The theory of spontaneous generation is, as we described, the arising or the origination of life from nothing, right? That, that spontaneously we can produce these, these organisms will arise from nothing. And what we learned was through these experiments, right, from Louis Pasteur with his flask, that if there were no air, if, if there was no contact with the air, these organisms would not originate. So he was certainly able to disprove that theory quite well. Probably you will get exam questions on all of these discoveries and all of these pioneers. I can guarantee you that. They always certainly have a history portion on these exams. So uh, the, the final, uh, the last example five, what is penicillin and where does it come from? So penicillin is a fungi or it's a product of a fungi. And uh, it, it is and will be one of the class of organisms that we're going to discuss. So we're going to discuss fungi. But the interesting thing about fungi is, you know, they, they seem to be very primitive. And in some cases, they are primitive, but they are eukaryotic cells. So we will talk about what are eukaryotic cells, what are prokaryotic cells. So the bacteria for 
instance, our, prokary our prokaryotic cells, eukaryotes that we're going to discuss in this class are the fungi, the protozoa, and the helminths. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about insects as well. These are all eukaryotic cells, and one of the things we're going to learn is that the immune system has a more difficult time identifying the eukaryotes, believe it or not, because they are less different from the human cells, which are also eukaryotic. It's so-called easier, if you can say that, uh, for the human immune system to be able to recognize the prokaryotes. So that concludes our first lecture of our microbiology course. Thank you so much for visiting educator.com.